Greetings to the world. We are before your presence this morning. We are here to thank you for your message, for all that you've been doing for us. We thank you for protecting and guiding our leader, Mazin Namdekano, and all those that are assisting him. We also bring before you the efforts, the sick, the poor, and the homeless bring them before you, that you comfort them, that at the end, they will rest, be happy, and forget their ordeal. It is what we have encountered. It is the price we are paying for us being blessed. And we beg that you change the mind of our people. Those that have missed their ways, redirect them. Change their mind so that they will focus and know the journey we are undertaking. We remember our heroes and heroines, all these people paid the ultimate price on our behalf. All this we ask in your name. You say, you say, you say. Today is June 2, 2020, and this is live broadcast from Radio Biafra USA. It's coming to you through Radio Biafra London, deputized by Mazi Uchemefo, and we're under the leadership of Mazi Namde. Hello, my name is Maziel Ozie. Um, let's um, get on with our 
topic like I said yesterday um, since last week we impact on this um, honoring our heroes and heroines for Memorial Day May 30th I said um, the history has been void when it relates to our people they don't know what happened they don't know what they did to us they don't know how it happened and the cause or the causes like I said um, we will continue with it when you are informed when you know then it will be appropriate for you to take uh, the right decision to know why we are doing what we are doing we have not been treated fairly we gave all the chances we sacrificed but uh, the plans against us is just uh, not a plan for friends this plan made out to finish us it's a shame to finish us we are not the same and uh, we will never be the same as we say we still uh, encounter obstacles every day <clears throat> we, are we get all kinds of obstacles and then um, we overcome them you go you say this is uh, Nigeria um, and you dissect yourselves uh, you carve yourselves out and say you are one of this you are one of that um, uh, but it's not the truth <laughs> the hatred is too much and for us to be deceiving ourselves and continue to punish ourselves show that we are not we are not intelligent we don't embrace the truth uh, let me give you an example before <clears throat> I get to what I'm saying did you uh, witness what just happened in Ondo where uh, somebody from Imo was appointed in the government office of Ondo and the people of Ondo protested if you are one why are you protesting Now you can serve a surgeon anywhere you want if you're not from there you are wasting your time I'm just giving you an example and that is leading me to what we started yes yesterday and that I said um, I will continue from now on be informed be informed and you will be informed and that is what we're doing get your paper and your pen and jot down what we are saying jot down what we are telling you then you do your own um, assessment did it happen or did it not happen has anything changed why are things worse instead of being better why is it worse why 
let's continue where we stopped yesterday and then um, shut down what you feel uh, will be of help to you. And he pointed a clause such as the political activist Fumi Ransom Kuti and the renowned jurist Jaja Wachuku that led the fight for Nigeria's sovereignty. According to some historians, many of the northern elites were not at all welcoming to the idea of an independent Nigeria, as they feared that independence would mean losing the privileged positions that they had enjoyed under the colonial structure. The story goes that as a condition for them agreeing to support the push for Nigeria's independence, the northern leadership specifically demanded that the new nation maintain its colonial political structure. And even though it pretty much guaranteed a continuation of the north's dominance, the Igbo and Yoruba leaders, in their desperation to gain independence at all costs, agreed to the north's demands. And so upon its... You captured that. You captured that part. The North never wanted them to be free. They wanted to be under the guardianship or leadership of the British. And you see the sacrifice that people made. The Yorubas and the Igbos, the South. They have to pledge. If they are not willing to opt off uh, and be free, uh, did you ask yourself why? And you've seen the tie between the Br British and the, the Fulanis. They advise them, go and say this, go and do this, and they do as they tell them to do. If we tie you up, and if you let them, if you let them be free and take over the government, uh, you will be nowhere. But is there anything to substantiate or to back up their claim? None. That is the grassroots of divide and rule. That's where the germination, they planted, divide and rule, and it germinated. And it, it grew branches all over. And today, the branches are too big we are trying to cut it down, trim them. And uh, the Fulanese, now we know the difference between the Fulanese and the Houses. Do they realistically think that they will be abandoned if we go our separate ways? I don't think so. They have not made any evaluation on, of the other side. Up to today, they still value the presence of foreigners ruling them. Because right in their mind, they will value the act activities of ex experts rather than employ you or accept you. COVID-19, an, an example. You saw what happened. And they are paying the price. The innocent ones are paying the price. Let's continue. Let's continue because um, you must know. For Nigeria's independence, the northern leadership specifically demanded that the new nation maintain its colonial political structure. And even though it pretty much guaranteed a continuation of the north's dominance, the Igbo and Yoruba leaders, in their desperation to gain independence at all costs, agreed to the north's demands. 
and so upon its independence on the 1st of October 1960, the Nigerian state was divided into three geopolitical regions in which a disproportionately large northern region was united with two smaller eastern and western regions. Nigeria's British-style parliamentary government was led by its first and only Prime Minister, Al-Haji Abubakar Tafawa Balewa, the northern co-founder of his political party, the Northern People's Congress. Tafawa Balewa's NPC party governed in coalition with the Igbo-aligned National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroons, which was led by Nigeria's Governor General, Dr. Unamdi Azikiwe, the man who would later go on to serve as the ceremonial president of the First Nigerian Republic, which was established in 1963. The <clears throat> that was a ceremonial president, powerless, just like the queen. But you saw where they wielded the power. For him to be relevant, he aligned uh, with the North. And you saw how they carved it out. North, East, and West. Watch what's going to happen. So when, see how they dissected Nigeria. It was an experiment, a venture, something that is not attainable. But we, the present people, we, the young ones, must hold on to it and ensure that this amalgamation is disamalgamated so that peace will reign, respect for humanity will flourish. headed by Chief Obafemi Awolowo, played the opposition role. If unity was the goal, then the Nigerian state had gotten off to a very bad start. Nigeria's parliamentary system was a bit of a farce, as Nigeria's three main parties were not built around ideology, but on ethnic nationalism. With the vast majority of Nigeria's general population still largely unfamiliar with the Western-style democratic system of their new country, pretty much everyone voted based on ethnicity. The Southwesterners voted for the AG, the Southeasterners for the NCNC, and the Northerners for the NPC. And as the Northern region was by far the largest constituency, the NPC was basically guaranteed control over Nigeria as none of the other two parties could compete with the NPC's large Northern voting base. As you can imagine, it was only a matter of time before the shoddy foundations on which the Nigerian state had been built began to show serious signs of strain. The entrepreneurial spirit of the Igbos would see many of them move out of their hometowns in search of all the opportunities their new nation had to offer, from Lagos to Benin, Port Harcourt, and even major northern cities like Kano and Kaduna. Igbos began to build businesses and pioneer new industries in the places they migrated to. But as is often the case with successful immigrants, it wasn't long before many of the locals, especially in the north, began to feel more than a bit uncomfortable with the success of their new neighbors. The success of their new neighbors. You are strange. You are strange. You are a stranger in our land. Large voting constituencies in the north. That is the way they put it. Because they included middle belt as part of the north. Just to swindle you. The white men knew what they were doing. They knew what they were doing, and they are still doing it. Resource control. Where they take your oil, you don't know how many barrels you are taking a day. I don't know how they pay for it. I don't know how they account quantity they are taking. Let's continue. One thing 
thing I've noticed, Premier, while I've been here, is that Northerners seem to have, I might almost call it, obsession about the Ebers. Could you perhaps explain that to me? Well, the Ebers are more or less the type of people whose desire is mainly to dominate everybody. If they go to a village, to a town, they want to monopolize everything in that area. If you put them in a labor camp as a laborer, within a year they will try to emerge as headman of that camp, and so on. Well, in, in the past, our people were not alive to their responsibilities, because you can see from our northernization policy that in 1952, when I came here, there were 10 northerners in our civil service here. Then I tried to have it northernized, and now all, all important posts are being held by northerners. Is this policy of filling all key posts in the north solely with northerners and not with other Nigerians a temporary or permanent one? In actual fact, what it is is a northerner first. Did you get it? Did you get it? First of all, Nigeria is northernized and the northerner first. And that reigns up till date. So when you're fighting for one Nigeria, what they started before 1960 has been flourishing. Brighter and more attractive today than it was then. They become bolder because we refused to see what is happening to us. We are not the same. We'll never be the same. And listen to what Bello said fully. Then you will understand where we stand today. If you can't get a northerner, then we take an expatriate like yourself on contract. If we can't, then we can employ another Nigerian, but on contract too. This is going to be permanent, I should say, for the, as far as I can foresee, because it would be rather dangerous to see the number of boys who are now turning from our, all our learning institutions coming out with having no, no work to do. I'm sure whichever government of the day might be, it will uh, feel rather embarrassed and it might even lead to bloodshed. That's <clears throat> Did you get that? They are providing for their generation to come at your expense. They are providing for their generation to come. They have started thinking what will happen. They are less educated. But they are saying now we are getting education. What will happen with these our children? But you, that is more educated, you are not planning for your generation to come. Rather, you are blocking their future. And you don't care how this our uh, youth will feel. And this is the frustration. They are everywhere, not only in the north, but in your own county, in your own city council. They are the police chief. They are educated ones, are their chief of police. Army, everything, they are in control. Northernization policy, we never took serious. And today they are in our backyard, in our kitchen. We're still not taking anything very serious. Rather, we are here fighting ourselves. This damage the idea, sir, of uh, all people in all regions in Nigeria being fellow citizens of one country. Well, it might, but uh, um, you are, I mean, new to our region, but how many northerners are employed in? or in the West? The answer is no.
and if there are, there may be ten laborers employed only in the two regions. It was against this backdrop of rising anti Igbo sentiment in the north that the chain of events that ultimately led to the civil war would begin to unfold. By as early as the year 1966, most Nigerians had already begun to resent the ruling elite for their lavish lifestyles and lack of sensitivity to the concerns of the masses. Rumors about vote rigging, corruption, and backdoor deals between politicians and foreign companies began to spread, and there was a general sense of discontentment in the air. Deciding that enough was enough, Major Chukuma Kaduna Inziogu, an Igbo officer in the Nigerian army, instigated a revolutionary coup against the federal government. This coup would see the assassination of the Prime Minister Tafua Palewa, the Premier of the Northern Region, Sir Amadou Bello, as well as the Premier of the Western Region, Chief Samuel Akintola. But rather suspiciously, the President, Dr. Namdi Azikiwe, would manage to escape the bloodbath as he was out of the country on holiday when the coup took place. But despite the execution of many key members of the government, the coup led by Major Inziogu was ultimately unsuccessful, as it was quashed by a different faction of the Nigerian army, led by Major General Johnson Aguyi Ironsi, who, interestingly enough, was also of Igbo ancestry. After managing to secure the surrender of the coup plotters, Aguyi Ironsi was declared military head of state. But even though both the instigator and the stopper of the coup were of Igbo descent, various conspiracy theories began to spread in the north, suggesting that the entire thing was all part of an undercover master plan to put General Aguyi Ironsi in power and transfer control of Nigeria over to the Igbos. Oddly enough, there was actually a fair bit of evidence in support of this theory. Four out of five of the coup plotters were Igbo, and although Aguyi Ironsi stopped the coup, he did not execute any of the coup plotters. Um, this is where they tried to justify that it is evil coup. And uh, it has been proven that it is not. And there were circumstances that uh, made those Eastern officials escape. Um, Zeke was already in London before then. And our father had a guest from... Uh, Turkey uh, Prime Minister Cypriot. That was why they were not killed. They were not spared because they are Igbos. And who stopped the coup? Igbo man. Let Major General Agui Yunusi, who was killed. With Fadri, that is that's that's the truth. But they will support their their claim. But um, as you will let us see, all the people they killed after the coup has nothing to do with the coup. The poison is there, hatred for the evil man, and it still persists as we speak. To make matters worse, no significant Igbo leader was killed in the coup. President Namdi Azikiwe had avoided all the drama thanks to his suspiciously timed holiday, while Michael Opara, the premier of the eastern region, had also managed to survive the coup, even though he did end up losing his job to Colonel Chukwe Ochuku, the man who would later go on to lead Biafra's attempt to break away from Nigeria. These anti igbo conspiracy theories would eventually grow from mere rumor and conjecture to an article of faith in the minds of many northerners. And on the 29th of July 1966, a group of northern army officers instigated a counter coup against the Iranzi administration. Unlike the previous one, this coup was successful. Major General Agui Iranzi was assassinated and Lieutenant Colonel Yakubu Gawan, a northerner, was installed as Nigeria's new military head of state. Unfortunately, the northern retaliation would not end there. In the three months following the coup, an estimated 8,000 to 30,000 southeasterners living in the north would be attacked, 
killed and robbed by local mobs. Fearing for their lives, over 1 million Southeasterners fled back to their homelands, leaving behind businesses, homes, churches, and in some unfortunate cases, children that had been the fruit of inter-ethnic marriages. With the deluge of refugees flooding back into the eastern region with shocking stories of betrayal and trauma, the Nigerian project was on the brink of collapse. Did you hear what he said last? The Nigerian project. It is a project. It's not a country. It has never been a country. It is the will of the British turning. And we continue to spill the blood. The <laughs> when are we going to wake up? Let's continue. As many Easterners no longer felt safe in other parts of Nigeria, the military governor of the Eastern region, Colonel Ojuku, began to call for Igbos from all around Nigeria to return home. Rumors about the Eastern region's impending breakaway from Nigeria became front page news after it was reported that a plane carrying imported weapons had crashed in the eastern city of Enugu. Knowingly or unknowingly, Colonel Ojuku essentially confirmed all rumors with a series of rousing criticisms of the Gowon administration's failure to provide adequate protection to the thousands of Igbos who were being attacked and killed by people they imagined were their fellow citizens. Did he do that? No. Did they protect us? No. The same thing that is happening now, they are not protecting any of us. They are still killing us. Not over there, but in our own homes. With tensions at an all-time high, General Yakubu Kowan and other key members of the government agreed to meet with Colonel Ojuku at a neutral location so that both sides could try to de-escalate the situation. This two-day meeting will take place in the Ghanaian town of Aburi from the 4th to the 5th of January, 1967. To Gowon's great surprise, Colonel Lujuku took the meeting very seriously and was very well prepared. He set out very clearly all of the eastern region's demands, which included greater political autonomy, greater control over the revenue from the southeast oil deposits, and also a restructuring of the Nigerian army in a way that devolved powers to the regions and got rid of the unfair recruitment quota system which had allowed for a disproportionately large number of northerners to join the Nigerian army. Although many still debate what exactly was agreed at this meeting, General Ojuku left Aburi fully convinced that Gowon had accepted all of the eastern region's demands. This controversial agreement, known today as the Aburi Accord, was not honored by the Gowan administration. Upon returning to Nigeria, General Yakubu Gowan decided instead to break Nigeria's regions into smaller states and turn Nigeria into an American-style federation composed of 12 states. Except unlike in the American system, each state had very little autonomy and very little control over its own resources. Do you see the handwork of Britain? They knew they weren't going to own up anything, and they were surprised that let Jim Ojuku took the meeting seriously. They didn't take it seriously, but Ojuku did. Why are we only the ones trying to make Nigeria work? But they are seriously making it not work. The British are busy playing their games. For many in the Southeast, this was the last straw. With the Gowon administration having put its cards on the table, Colonel Ojuku's mind was made up. He proceeded to consult with the various chiefs and traditional rulers of the Eastern region. And on the 30th of May, 1967, Ojuku officially announced the cessation of the Eastern region and the establishment of the state of Biafra. And with the support of many key members of the Southeastern leadership, 
Colonel Ojuku cut all ties with the Nigerian army and was proclaimed General Ojuku, Biafran president and commander in chief of the Biafran army. Uh, you missed it, but I'll point it out to you. Southeast. Southeast. Southeast covered all Biafra land. All of the Biafra land. So when you're today talking about your, you being Niger Delta, you being this, you being Cross River, first of all, the war was fought against Biafra, which, which is you. You Cross River, you and Kwaibom, they are calling you today. And that is why whatever is happening anywhere in Biafra land is happening in your own backyard as well. So when you see our leader fuming, you should know why he is fuming. Trying to put your Biafra into state show that they don't mean good for us. And all the leaders handed authority to Juku. They clear war and save us. We are brothers. We are the same. We can't be divided. But you are going to see what happened. The declaration of Biafra's secession was celebrated in the streets. For many, the establishment of Biafra was a long-awaited restoration of the pre-colonial sovereignty of the region and the beginning of a bright new dawn for its people. But unfortunately, the celebrations would be short-lived as the Nigerian government's response was to declare war on Biafra. And although the Biafran army had no air force, no navy, and a chronic shortage of weapons and manpower, General Ojuku was surprisingly optimistic about his new nation's ability to withstand the Nigerian army. Civil war comes, and I do think it is imminent. You're quite right. It will for us be the price of freedom. Our people here have for a long time been prepared for this eventuality, and I am confident of their readiness. I think that when it does come, that the people on the other side would be surprised as to what they're going to get. And I'm confident that it will not last long. I can't say for certain what Lagos has got. Um, when we lost direct contact with Lagos, they had some four battalions ill-equipped, and um, I know that they have been purchasing a lot of arms since, and I know that they have negotiated and received a few armored vehicles. Prior to that, they had some scout cars. I know they have tried to get planes. I am not sure they have got them there. But on our side, we too have not been sitting quietly. There has been quite a lot of build-up. And I think what I have here is sufficient to maintain the integrity of Biafra and more. He made his research, he made his assessment before going to war. But Britain did their evil work. And 
and we did our own. And we surprised them. But putting aside General Ojoko's confident fighting talk, the reality of the matter was that Biafra was by far the underdog in this fight. The Nigerian military was larger, better funded, better trained, and had secured the support of Britain and other world powers. The expectation in Lagos was for the war to be over within a matter of weeks, or in the very worst case scenario, six months. Okay, you hear that? But much to the surprise of the Nigerians, the Biafran army would prove a lot more resilient than they could have ever imagined. Despite being composed of a largely untrained and unskilled group of young men and teenage boys, the Biafrans would manage to withstand the Nigerian onslaught for three brutal years. The early campaigns of the Nigerian forces were quite successful, as they quickly managed to reclaim significant Biafran cities and monuments.
government strategy was indefensible. It is important to point out that the government's supposed reasoning at the time was that the blockade would be nothing more than a short, sharp shock, and that General Ojuku, seeing the immense suffering of his people and the dwindling ammunition of his frontline soldiers, would have no other choice but to surrender. had failed to realize was that the Biafran state had secured the support of a foreign benefactor of its own. Although the only countries to publicly recognize the state of Biafra were Tanzania, Gabon, the Ivory Coast, Zambia, and Haiti, Charles de Gaulle's France had taken a secret interest in Biafra as it saw it as the perfect addition to its sphere of influence in West Africa. According to French President Charles de Gaulle, Biafra was a just and noble cause. And so, working closely with the French aligned governments of the Ivory Coast under President Félix Oufred Boigny and the Gabonese Republic, led by President Omar Bongo, the French government helped to prolong the war by providing Biafra with weapons, mercenary fighters, and as much food as could be smuggled past the Nigerian blockade. France also publicized Biafra's cause on the international stage, describing the situation as nothing short of a genocide. The eventual discovery of France's involvement in the war would lead to protests on the streets of Lagos, with many accusing the French government of being the real reason why the war had continued, despite the fact that the Biafran forces had very little chance of overcoming the Nigerian military. But did France really get involved in the war simply because Charles de Gaulle considered Biafra to be a just and noble cause? Well, not exactly. France's involvement was all about economics and had very little to do with some romantic desire for the Biafran people to share in the French ideals of liberté, égalité, and fraternité. Later investigations will show how the French state-owned oil company ELF had secured lucrative drilling agreements with the Biafran state. Had Biafra successfully seceded from Nigeria, these agreements would have guaranteed ELF access to the equivalent of 7% of Nigeria's oil supply and giving the French government a nice slice of the Nigerian pie, which since the discovery of oil back in 1956, had been enjoyed solely by the Shell BP oil company. Although the French government tried to keep its ties to Biafra secret, General Juku did very little to hide his country's French connection. From as early as the first year of the war, General Juku had already begun to suggest that French would be made compulsory in Biafran secondary, technical, and teacher training schools. In his own words, he was very keen for his people to benefit from the rich culture of the French-speaking world. As the death toll began to rise exponentially, the whole world was becoming more aware of the level of carnage and immense suffering of the Biafran people. The Nigerian diaspora was galvanized, and protests and counter-protests began to take place on the streets of London and New York. Some Nigerians blamed General Ojuku for the deaths of his own people, arguing that by continuing in a war that he knew fully well he could not win, he was putting his personal ambition ahead of the lives of millions of people. But for many in the Biafran diaspora, the economic blockade was nothing short of a vicious genocide aimed at exterminating the evil people once and for all. Another accusation that was thrown at General Ojuku was that the only way he managed to cajole his army and his people to continue in the fight for Biafra was by reporting stories of false victories and by giving false guarantees about the imminent end of the war. Yes, that's the propaganda of the BBC. <clears throat> if it wasn't, why did it take them three years? If he wasn't telling the truth, they thought it would be a walkover. They gave it maximum six weeks. They would finish us. 
they were prepared to nuke us. We prayed and supplied it to them. That's how far their hatred goes when it comes to you. And today, they have met their match. They are going to the Arab countries, the ones that helped them fight before. They did not fight the war. Britain, Russia, Egypt, all the Arab countries fought there for three years. We are strong. We are formidable. And we're ready to do it again. This time, with our eyes open. This is why we must sort out all these saboteurs. And there are many of them because they did not know history. Now, if you know history and you still feel that you want to die, you want to be a slave throughout your lifetime, we wish you luck. Let's continue. On the Nigerian side, the government continued to double down on its position. Despite reports of horrific levels of death and suffering, the gowan led government refused to blink first and continued to accuse General Ojuku of killing his own people by lying to them about their chances of winning the war. I do not wish to say anything on this occasion that might be regarded as prejudicial to the peace talks now going on in Kampala, Uganda. But in the words of Mr. Asika, the rebel leaders ought to know when enough is enough. They should call a halt to the shameless deception of innocent evils with reports of fictitious victories on the battlefronts. They should appreciate that the so-called diplomatic recognition by dubious characters cannot, in the least, alter the course of Nigerian history. It is sheer wickedness for Ojuku and his clique to continue to guard innocent citizens to support rebellion and lay down their lives for a cause that is not just. The rebel leaders know in their hearts of hearts that all their false propaganda about genocide and massacre derives from personal ambition and the haunting fear of their own future and safety. Did you hear what he said? Did you see? Did you hear? Yes, that's what Gohan said. You've forgotten how many their friends were killed. You've forgotten how the war started. You've forgotten how they said they're going to crush you. All of a sudden, with the British propaganda, you are accusing our Dim Ujuku of starting a war fully backed by Britain. Today, they are doing the same thing again, repeating the past. Consequently, they do not know when to stop. I call on those who claim to love Nigeria and the Igbos to face realities and advise the people of the East Central State to lay down their arms and return to the fold. People of East Central State, their friends. You see, Obabi Aseka was the saboteur who they later gave to be the governor of East Central State. Biafra. Biafra land. That is when the state started. East Central, not Central. It is not enough for organizations and individuals to ask the federal government to cease hostilities while ignoring the evil intentions of the rebels. I honestly believe it is in the true interest of the evils that they return to the fatherland. Um, the true interest of the evils to return to their fatherland our fatherland is Biafra land, 
the east, not the north, not the west, the east.